Did you ever notice that sometimes good news is actually bad news in disguise? There's a news story going around right now that has a lot of people really excited. It's a very positive thing. It's a positive event that it's happening. But unfortunately, positive as this thing may seem on the surface, it could turn into the final nail in our coffin. So let's talk about it. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. So it looks plausible that Tucker Carlson is going to be interviewing Vladimir Putin. Who knows whether it's going to happen or not yet, but the mere specter of this occurring is something that is really important because the fact that it could happen is something that could shape world events because there are a lot of people in power that don't want it to happen and they may take actions ahead of it happening, anticipating that it may. So it's an important thing that we talk about it right now. First off, I want to put my cards on the table. My thoughts about Tucker Carlson uh, have never been particularly positive. When he was working at Fox News, I felt that he was just kind of a corporate shill talking mouthpiece for the business interests behind Fox News. Since he left that organization, I've uh, had a bit of more of a, a nuanced sense of him when he did a a recent story on Julian Assange. I thought that was a good piece of journalism and it was a important story to get out into the world. Uh, but, you know, as to where, where he is and what his particular agenda is, you know, no one can say for sure, but it's important to listen to different uh, perspectives, no matter what they might be. So from that perspective alone, I think it's important to just listen to what he has to say and listen to what the interview subjects that he's interviewing have to say. As far as my thoughts on Vladimir Putin go, he is a former KGB officer, and I feel like that's about as far as I need to know about him. He may be a wonderful family man. I'm sure he's delightful around his friends and associates. Maybe maybe not. Who, who the hell knows? I do know that I, I'm not chomping at the bit to live in a country where I am under his rule. Uh, but he is an important and powerful world figure, and for that reason alone, it's important to hear what he has to say. And hearing what he has to say is exactly what is frightening to a lot of leaders in the West, who up until now have had a real monopoly on the narrative, where they could essentially put words into the mouth of whoever their adversary is, and the populations in their countries would you know, only have that to digest. And it's frightening to people in control uh, to lose control or potentially lose control of the narrative. And that is what I think is concerning about this interview that's coming up because it could force the hand of certain people that don't wanna lose control of the narrative towards other more extreme ways of pushing their agenda forward. But before we talk about you know, those potential actions that might be taken, I wanna talk about what I think people are probably nervous about. And what they're probably nervous about is two things. One, this interview certainly is going to be used for propaganda purposes. I, any world leader would be out of their mind to not take advantage of a situation like this, to use it for their own propagandistic sorts of ends. And Vladimir Putin, I'm, as a former KGB officer, I'm sure is going to make full use of this as a platform for propaganda. But what the real danger here is, uh, is that I think that in order to disseminate the type of propaganda that is going to be beneficial to Russia, and that type of propaganda is going to be uh, information that will create divisions in the West. In order to create those divisions in the West, I think that Vladimir Putin can pretty much just stick to the truth. And that is the most dangerous type of propaganda at all. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, we had misinformation floating around, which is incorrect things that are being uh, believed to be true, although a lot of the things that were deemed misinformation turned out to be true later on. But there's another type of information that even from the get-go, the powers that be don't even call it misinformation, they call it malinformation. And malinformation is information that is true, but is not helpful to the narrative that you're trying to set, not helpful to your uh, business goals of trying to sell as much of uh, a certain type of product that you might want to set. Malinformation is true information that is not seen as being helpful to the powers that be. And I think that malinformation is going to be heavily present in this interview because I think that the truth from the perspective of Russia is going to have a lot of utility 
for propaganda because the truth itself, I think, is heavily divisive here in the West. Because I think the truth of the situation is that Russia does not have the aspirations that a lot of Western political leaders have painted them with. Russia does not, at least in the, in the short to midterm, does not have aspirations to take over the entire planet, to invade all of uh, Europe with militaries, uh, you know, to send its uh, power all over the world and essentially take over the entire planet. That is the way that they have been being painted by Western leaders. But I don't think that's the truth. I think that the truth of the matter is that Russia just wants to regain dominion over areas that they formerly had had dominion uh, over during the USSR uh, era. That includes obviously Ukraine and uh, you know countries uh, north of that, Latvia, Estonia, uh, you know Belarus. It seems like they already got plenty of sway in there already. But it seems to me that that is Russia's main goal at this point is just to create that former kind of dominion over their neighborhood, if you will. And the reason that that is dangerous from the perspective of Western leaders is that I think that that as a goal for Russia is probably something that most people in the West are kind of okay with. The world lived with a situation where Russia had dominance over these areas for decades and we were able to avoid any major conflicts. There were some proxy wars here and there, but things never went nuclear at that point. And at this point, we are tiptoeing and dancing up to the line of going nuclear ostensibly to avoid going back into a situation which, you know, as unpleasant as it may have been for many people, was a somewhat stable situation which did not go nuclear. So we're threatening to enter into nuclear war to avoid a situation that we've demonstrated at least once in the past did not lead to nuclear war. And I think that that is probably something that's digestible and acceptable to many people in the West, especially when the alternative are the types of things that we've been talking about recently, which is escalation towards more war, possibly something that people would call World War III, although we, I think we're kind of already in that at this point, given the number of countries that are involved in wars uh, all over the world. Uh, th things like, you know, the draft, uh, conscripted service, uh, you know, the levels of danger that it would represent to all the different populations. I think as an alternative to that, the idea of Russia just regaining dominion over areas that they used to have dominion over is probably something that many people in the West would be okay with. And that doesn't work towards the agenda of the political elite right now who don't want that to happen for whatever their personal reasons are, whether they are uh, ideological, that they just don't want to see that happen again, whether they are political, that uh, you know certain people must be aware that when you enter into these kind of conflict scenarios, uh, your, uh, uh, your life as a politician tends to get extended because uh, people don't tend to you know, vote out their politicians when they're in the middle of a conflict. Whatever the reasons are, it seems that our politicians are dead set towards bringing us towards this conflict and the idea that this interview could create a situation where de-escalation could be possible, where an off-ramp could be offered, and where the populations of the Western countries could start to fracture from their leadership and start believing that maybe these different ideas are not such a bad deal, that's gonna be a problem. And that brings me to the second part is, well, what are people likely to do about it? Well, who knows <laughs> at this point? That's why we prep, because you don't really know what the future can be. But uh, one thing that would be likely is uh, for there to be events that are gonna kind of kick things off. And, you know, we are already uh, looking at a world where there are all these little simmering pots, you know, just waiting to explode. And if those things could be brought to a boil sooner, if uh, things could be meant to fall apart or explode sooner, it could kind of get a, ahead of the news cycle on these kind of de-escalation uh, uh, potentials, these de-escalation opportunities, and it could get people to a point where, uh, you know, they're just so riled up into a, a frenzy of fear, uh, you know, that the opportunity for de-escalation is not, just not going to be there anymore. And that would be my fear, is that with the specter of this interview occurring and with the likelihood of what is going to be in that interview because I think again both the truth and reality of the situation and the propagandistic um, goals of Russia being in alignment with each other it's very likely that the interview is going to be suggested as an off-ramp uh, an opportunity for people to kind of cut a deal and politicians clearly don't want to do that as evidenced by the fact that there have been deals put on the table in the past that they have walked away from. And when deals were close to being agreed upon, Western countries pushed in and you know, did what they could to make sure that those deals didn't happen. 
one of those situations, uh, and this isn't proven at this point, but the only people who had anything to gain from the Nord Stream pipeline attack were the Western back groups who want to push the conflict forward. Uh, the Nord Stream pipeline was a link, an economic link between Russia and Germany, and severing that economic link also was a way of severing diplomatic links between the countries because no longer was Germany dependent on Russia for energy. It was forced that way by cutting the pipeline. So it destroyed an opportunity for Germany to be swayed diplomatically by Russia's case uh, by you know, taking away any reasons that they had to possibly side with Russia. So there is a demonstrated interest of the powers that be, whoever those may be, and I'm not pointing fingers at any one specific country, but clearly there are powers that want to try to push this towards conflict because Nord Stream happened, because there was an interest in pushing things toward conflict. And uh, who knows what people will do next. I know here in the United States, uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about issues with the borders here in the United States and people coming across the border that could possibly you know, be up to no good, so to speak. Now, the border issue is a, a complex question. I think that it has, there's a lot of hypocrisy in it. Clearly, the United States needs workers coming in from other countries. We have an aging demographic. We need people coming in in order to do jobs that a lot of Americans just clearly aren't interested in doing. We need those people coming in. I don't think it makes a lot of sense for people to just be kind of like randomly coming in. Uh, you know, it just makes sense to have, you know, areas where people come through so you kind of know who's coming in and out of your country. Uh, the problem, obviously, is that those uh, those areas are not run uh, very well. They're run in a way where it just, it, you know, people just can't, you can't get the number of people through these bottlenecks that, uh, you know, that are needed. There's so much red tape. I mean, we as Americans know all about the red tape in our own government. Imagine how bad it is for people who aren't even citizens, you know, trying to uh, come into our, our country to, to do work. And, and, you know, it's arguable as to whether or not that situation is intentional or not. Maybe the government government is intentionally doing a really piss poor job at getting people in so that they are going to come in through other means because it creates this sense of anxiety with people when people are coming in, you know, unknown and secretly and, you know, coming in illegally. And that certainly plays into the hands of a lot of politicians because it creates a lot of division between us. So again, there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, on this topic, but one thing that you can't argue is that if people are coming in uh, secretly, uh, there could be anyone in here. And that sets us up for another situation like back in 2001 where there were people coming into the country that were interested in doing things that were negative. And uh, there have been many instances throughout history where something was going to happen. And, uh, you know, for one reason or another, the government decided not to act and decided to allow it to happen. What happened in 2001, there was speculation. I don't think that it's necessarily proven, but there is speculation, which I think has some merit behind it, that... Uh, People knew about what was going on, or some people knew about what was going on, but they allowed it to happen because it was for the greater good. Uh, there was a thought that the United States needed to engage itself in, does it sound familiar at all? The United States needed to engage itself fully in wars in other countries of the world where there was not an appetite of, of the American people to engage in those types of wars. I uh, remember the old axis of evil that we were, were, were talking about, and you know, we went in and uh, you know, Iraq was one of the countries on there. People never would have been convinced to go into Iraq you know, using misinformation, uh, saying that it, uh, Iraq you know, was kind of somewhat maybe possibly related to the events of 9-11 uh, and that they were creating weapons of mass destruction. You know, that was all misinformation at, the, at that point, but people never would have ever agreed to go into Iraq. It never would have had any kind of public support at all had not the events of 9-11 occurred. There were people within government that had even to openly talked about the idea that there was a need for another Pearl Harbor style attack. And there's a lot, a lot of speculation about Pearl Harbor as well, which I'm not going to get into here. Uh, but there was a need for another Pearl Harbor level uh, type of attack on the American people to catalyze us to you know, convince us to go into these wars that, you know, these people, you know, and I'll take them at their word, felt were important for the United States to get into. And I guess arguably so, because the United States is addicted to energy and we needed to go into these, ener uh, these energy rich countries and, and take over. And, you know, that's what we ended up doing. So, you know, maybe it was for the greater good, maybe it wasn't for the greater good, certainly not for the greater good of all the people that died in those conflicts. But there is a, there is a precedent that this is something that is at least talked about in government circles that sometimes for the greater good, if you see something coming, you might step out of the way, allow it to happen, to catalyze people, to convince people that something that you think is important needs to do, happen, gets done. And, you know, people at that level of power, you don't have to play with those types of things. You know, do we, do we lose a thousand people in this 
conflict, but we'll save 100,000 people by going into this conflict. These are the type, type of number games that people are playing. And you, you don't have to be purely cynical um, to engage in these types of things because there is a sense of the idea of the greater good where you can sacrifice something that's smaller than something that is you know the alternative that you might be losing uh, you know if you don't make that sacrifice and I think a lot of people don't like to think about that but you know that is that is a reality in our world that sometimes uh, you have to pay a price uh, you know a very dear price to avoid paying you know an even greater price in the future and that could be something that we're looking at right now where uh, if people in government feel as though going into this war uh, with Russia is something that's really important to the United States interest. And the United States hegemony of the world at the moment is what creates uh, our way of life here that we have right now. The, the buying power of the US dollar is backed by the fact that when the US wants to do something, it, I mean, it's becoming less and less the case, but when the US wants uh, to do something, their military allows them to do that. I think we've seen a lot of instances recently where that's been demonstrated to not be true, but people in the world still seem to kind of believe that. And insofar as people believe it, it's all about belief. It's all about faith, uh, uh, you know, in a fiat currency. It's the faith in the currency, the faith in that government to be able to do what it uh, says that it's going to do that puts the value into that money. And if we lose that, there are going to be prices to be paid here back in the United States. That is a reality. And if people think that the price to be paid by the U.S. losing that status uh, is enormous, and they feel like they have a chance at avoiding that price to be paid by making some kind of a sacrifice. You know, do you sacrifice several thousand lives in order to save several million? You know, that's a question that world leaders have to ask themselves. And if they're asking themselves that right now, if they're concerned that this Tucker Carlson interview might derail their plans to get into what they feel is a highly necessary war with Russia, and this is you know, th their perspective potentially, not my own, if they feel that that is a danger to that, they might feel like more kinetic, more uh, extreme methods might be required in order to get us into the, some kind of a conflict. And I question what those extreme methods might look like. The sun's starting to blind me in my face right now, so I think I'm gonna wrap this up right now. Leave your thoughts down in the comments below about things that you think might be um, possible, uh, you know, going on into the future. There is a video I'm gonna link to right now that was released recently of, um, uh, it was a press conference given by uh, some law enforcement official. And, uh, you know, they were talking about things very similar to this, that uh, there are things brewing potentially in this country that uh, there is not a level of preparation for. And if those things happened, they would make a lot of people very upset. And when people in a country get very upset, they are very easy to direct, direct that anger, direct that rage, direct that frustration and fear into conflict. And that's what my fear is, is that we are about to be, uh, we are about to be directed somewhere. We'll find out. That's it. And thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another one that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.